Hello class, uh, we're going to do some thematic mapping today. Uh, now there is the video from last semester which is also very informative. Um, this particular video is uh, just like last time uh, a, a sort of update because we're dealing with line data instead of point data. So please go click on this video. The link should be appearing right now somewhere on the screen and uh, watch that one as well. And we're going to just sort of uh, fill in the difference with this particular video. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you that uh, you need to keep all of your QGIS data organized the way that we've been talking about. You have to have a master QGIS data folder, then all your different projects should be in here. You'll just have one probably right now for San Pasquale. Um, this is the SPV survey where you uh, downloaded the zip file and you extracted it. That was what came out. And this is the project file that I provided you, the vector and raster folders. And you should be digitizing your area, and you should have made a new vector file, and it should be inside your vector folder. You should make a new folder with the same name as the shape file, because look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six files, uh, individual files, make up the actual vector shape file that loads in. If any of these get separated, you're going to have problems in QGIS. The main one that you always point QGIS to for a shapefile is this one that has the .shp. Uh, but if you're missing any of these, then uh, you may not be able to load it, or you'll be able to load it. And if you're, for example, missing the DBF, you won't have any attribute table data. You'll get an error message when you start up QGIS saying, cannot find the files, please find them for me. And depending on how you move these around, you may have lost them. The other thing that happens is you move just this file here with you and you forget to bring these other two folders with you. You've got to bring them all three together. So the safest way is to just grab this folder that contains all of these things. And if you want to move that to your little thumb drive or whatever, then everything should be fine as you go from computer to computer to computer. So I've started up QGIS with my project file here. Uh, just a couple little quick tips. If you want to check your project properties, you can go to the Project menu, Project Properties, and you can check a few things. What's the general CRS, the coordinate reference system? In this case, like we looked at before, it's latitude, longitude of WGS84. You can see what layers are included in the project file. So not just what you might be looking at, but <clears throat> you know because you might have changed something, this will tell you what's saved into it and whether you can uh, view it or not. Um, and then there are a few other things here that are a little less informative. But one thing that you want to check is that um, you have the project file saved in the right directory because you don't, QGIS won't force you to put them together, but you can always check the path to make sure that your data and project file are next to each other. And then you can always check this thing right here that it says relative. If it says absolute, it's going to want to follow this whole path all the way down. If it says relative, it's actually just going to go from basically from this folder then down. Whatever's parallel with this QGIS file, it'll follow that on down. If you want to be able to move your project from this computer to your thumb drive to your home computer, you got to make sure this says relative. And it should because I said it that way when I saved this, but maybe you made a new project and it saved it as absolute, and now you're having problems when you go from computer to computer. Those are some things to just double check. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to load in some vector data. Now, here are the ones that I did before, and a uh, quick uh, shortcut. You see how I went from project home and I was able to navigate right to my vector file because I was keeping my files organized. Then I could double click on this and then add it here at the top of the layer tree. And uh, what I'm going to do is to right click on it and click zoom to layer. And now it takes me right in to the few, um, I, I only did three last time, the few uh, structures that I have outlined. Now, depending on how many you have, you'll get further in zoom or you'll be further out. You can always check your scale down here. Um, what we want to do is to start styling these things. Uh, and you ha played around with this, so if I double click there, I get my layer properties. And you get style, fill, simple fill. 
And of course, you can uh, change the colors to blue or whatever they are and hit apply. You can change the thickness and hit apply or OK. Um, and you'll see that it changes it. Uh, oh, whoops, I was doing the survey grid. You can change it, uh, fill, simple fill, change the color, click OK, apply, and pen width, apply. And you'll see it changes it, but it changes it for all of the uh, structures at once. So very often, that's cool. That's what we want to do. But sometimes what we want to do is to put some meaning behind it. We want to take some data out of our table and use that to make different colors uh, so that we can get a quick look when we're looking at our map. Uh, just uh, on a quick glance, we can understand some of the patterning of the data uh, over space, basically like that. So we do that in the same panel. Uh, this is the properties dialog again, style panel. Now we've been working in this single symbol, symbol mode where everything is going to be exactly the same. What we want to do is to switch to one of these two categorized or graduated. These are similar, but they work slightly differently. They're both thematic map layers or thematic map styling tabs, right? So let's start with categorized. And the first thing you see is the tab is for columns. So that tells us, OK, well, we need to connect to our data. And when you click on it, you see all the three columns of data that exist in our table. Uh, so let's just go with type first, and we'll just see what happens. So uh, you first select the column uh, type, uh, and then you have to go down here and hit the classify button. And in our case, there's only two, but if you have four, five, six different kinds, you'll see four, five, or six different um, symbols show up here. And it has a legend value, and then I'll have a color value. So if we hit apply here, and I move this guy out of the way, all of a sudden we see now c different colors. So the houses are showing up in blue, and the cistern is showing up in, in pink in this particular uh, case. Uh, we can go into any of these things and double click on the actual symbol and we can change the color to what we want. So maybe we want the houses to be green. And in fact, maybe we want the houses to be a little thicker. We can totally do that. And when we hit apply, we will see that, oh, sorry, I, that was the cistern to be green and thicker, right? So the cistern changed. Now we can go here and change the house. We want to make the houses red and to make them thinner. Okay, and then we can hit apply, and then we'll see that that changed for the houses, but we left the cisterns alone. So that is really, really cool, right? And you can see how um, we can make a, a really cool map with um, all kinds of different symbols like this. Okay, let's click condition over here and then hit classify again, and I'll say, Do you want to switch? and you click yes. And now we only have one and two, um, but let us hit apply, and then we'll see what that looks like. So now we have this. Again, they're thin. So if we want to change the thickness altogether, we can go to where it says symbol here, and now we can increase that. And now we will see that we've uh, changed the thicknesses for all of them to be exactly the same. So you don't have to double click each individual line. Um, you can do some bulk changes by clicking here. Now, do we like these colors? Well, we can go in again and open them up and pick uh, colors that we like using these things over here. But what we might want to do is to pick a consistent color pattern. And now you'll see here this thing's called color ramp. And uh, by default, it's selected random colors. But if you click on it, you get all these beautiful color ramps. And so maybe we want to just do shades of blue. So we'll just hit uh, classify again and hit apply. And we'll see it's shades from white through blue. Now, if we had more than just two numbers, that might look better. But for two numbers, maybe it doesn't look good. So you should play around with some of these things. Some of them are divergent color palettes. And some of them are uh, ramp palettes where they progress from one color to the other. Um, and of course, you can always go back to random colors. And the cool thing about random colors is that every time you do it, it should, I believe, pick a slightly different set of colors uh, each time or each time you add a new 
data to this. If you go back to type and you hit classify, it should pick totally different colors. Yeah. And you can sort of uh, maybe get lucky with that. Um, so that's categorized. What it does is it just makes discrete categories based on your input data. If we have numeric data, if it was complex numeric data, you might have to pick cutoffs between them, but you could always do that and make a, a predefined uh, sort of uh, cutoff system there. Um, the other one that we can pick is graduated. And here, when we look, we can only pick numeric columns. So we can't pick or type anymore because it's text data. We can only pick condition. And here, we can actually choose either color, like we were just doing, it'll look fairly similar, or we can pick size, right? And um, what's really cool here, we can choose the number of classes. Uh, in our case, since we only have two, we should just pick two. And we can hit classify and uh, apply. And we will see that the line thicknesses are going to be really thick or really thin for one or for two. We can always double click in here and we can increase that size there so that we can actually see it, right? Apply. But we still get the sense, right, proportionally some of the lines are thicker and some of the lines are thinner. That is uh, a, just a different way of showing data thematically on the map uh, there. Uh, if we had more complex data, we could choose different breaks, uh, but equal interval is going to work for us for these lines. It's up to you to decide which one is better, the colors or the symbol size, uh, to display the information that you want. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to add um, from the 2017 structure outline, uh, and then I'm going to zoom to that layer, which is going to um, take up more, th more than just the little one area. And I'm going to hide my survey grid. And I'm going to sort of zoom in, let's see, just on this sort of central area here. And I'm going to open up the properties dialog. I'm going to go to style. I'm going to go graduated. I am going to pick, um, let's say, length. This would be length of the maximum length of the structure. And I'm going to do it by size. And I'm going to have five classes. I'm going to hit it there and hit apply. And now we should start to see some thicknesses. So you'll see the roads clearly are going to be the thicker ones, and some of the houses are going to be the thinner ones. OK, so maybe that wasn't the best thing. So let's do oh, um, width. Maybe that's better. Um, we'll hit classify again, and then hit apply. And then now we'll see some different thickness is showing up. So things that are wider will be thicker and things that are thinner will be smaller. Maybe we don't like doing it by size. Maybe we want to do by color again. And we'll pick a, a, a palette like this purple to orange one. Um, we'll hit classify and apply. And now we'll see some colors changing in the background over there. So you can actually see how cool that is. Um, we can go back to categorized. We can pick a different column. Uh, in this case, we might want to pick his um, original use, original U right there. And we can hit classify, and we can see, uh, let's just make this all a little thicker, make it easier for us to see, and hit apply. And now we can see all the different colors for all the different uses over there. Now, you can go back to the other video and see more tips about the next step. But in order to go from this to uh, to a finished map, you have to open a print composer. And you give it a name. I'm just going to call this one Map 1, but you should give it something more descriptive. And you click OK, and it brings you to a totally new view over here in which you can, um, well, you can add uh, a little map canvas over here. and will load things in from, from, your, um, from whatever you were looking at in the other canvas display over here. And now you can also add the legend. And the legend, at first, is going to be huge, right? Like this. You're going to have everything that you see over there. It's going to show up by default in the legend. I'm going to move myself over here. Um, so here we have properties for the map. So I'll go look at the other video for that. Properties for the legend, you can actually update from this panel over here where it says 
legend item. You can uh, uncheck the auto update, which sort of freezes it in place. And now you can start to remove things. So I don't want those ones. I don't want that thing to show up. I don't necessarily need the survey grid to show up because I'm not showing it. And now I have all of these things over here. And if I toggle, I can actually look at them. I can actually double click on any of them and I can change the text to something Bergamo processing, right? I can enter something more uh, descriptive in there. Uh, animal enc, what is that? I can just make it be animal enclosures, right? Uh, whatever. Spelling is not my strong suit, right? It would, ideally, I would have spelled that correctly. I can also remove stuff if I don't want it to show up here. Now you have to be careful because you don't want to remove things that are important, but if there are a lot of things that are um, redundant, especially if you've gone through over here and you have made, let's say, um, oh, let's go in here and look at uh, terraces and terrace walls. Let's say you wanted to make them exactly the same color because you wanted to sort of lump them together, right? So you make them both green, like so. Make them both green, okay, okay. So now they should be the same color. You see how they changed over here. And on my map, maybe I want to um, just get rid of this one that says T-Wall and just call them all terraces, right? And I can change that uh, to terraces and walls or something like that. So I can lump them together manually so that I just don't have so many options because maybe there's too many options here to be sensible. Um, now this is a terribly styled map. It's way it's zoomed out at the wrong scale. Um, you know the page isn't sized properly. Uh, so what you need to do is uh, look at the other video to look at how to make all of these things look a little nicer. But I'm going to end this video for now right here just because I've kind of showed you uh, all the things that I that I are a little different between doing this for points and doing this for lines. And then I've given you a couple extra little tips to help help you make your legends look nice when you have lots and lots and lots of categories that you don't necessarily want to show. Um, so Hopefully this is starting to make some sense and, uh, and during the practicum we can definitely go over this together and I'll show you exactly all the buttons and all that kind of stuff uh, to click. So see you soon.